Hello to everyone and thank you and welcome to our webinar of the tricks to picking the right design build team. We do thank you for being on time and spending your time with us this evening. Uh, we do want to make a few notes. For instance, we are recording this webinar, so we will be providing uh, a copy of this uh, sometime tomorrow, or if not the latest by Monday, but ideally by tomorrow. Um, so we are going to mute everyone in attendance as Megan will be presenting, just to be respectful and considerate of that. And we will have a Q&A at the end of our session. So if we have any questions along the way, feel free to send it to the chat and I will help moderate that with Megan to address your questions at the end. And looks like Megan's ready to go. <laughs> That's the theory, at any rate. So today you've got myself and you've got Michelle. So I am one of the uh, project uh, coordinators uh, at TQ Construction. Uh, my official title is Project Relations, and that's because I do a number of things at TQ. I've been with TQ for almost seven years now, and I've kind of worked my way through a good part of especially kind of like the office and administrative side of the company. Um, a big part of what I do is working with people as they're trying to determine what's feasible for them to take on as projects in their homes. And so um, today we're just kind of going over the, the general like process of how that typically is. So it's a nice uh, light kind of little webinar that we've got here going to get us started and get the ball rolling. Um, okay, so basically the what we're going over today is kind of from the point of when you're like, okay, I have a project that I want to take on in my home um, or possibly a new new home uh, all the way to like, selecting who you're going to work with and kind of pushing off from there. So that seemed like kind of a reasonable uh, period to, to tackle today. And uh, we will take on more of the process in following webinars. So the first thing that people tend to go through the process of is creating their shortlist, so to speak. Uh, and the places where you kind of look for that is, I mean, a lot of it is common sense where, you know, you're Googling and you're, you might be following some, some companies on social media, things that you kind of want to look at as you're kind of looking at reputable companies and who you'd like to work with is a combination of like long-term referrals. Um, uh, what's their track record been over the course of that company's lifetime, uh, what kind of projects do they typically work on? Are they are they very niche and specific? Or are they, you know, do they have like a, a pretty decent range in terms of what they work on and what they what they know their way around? Another great thing is kind of looking at different home builders associations. Uh, we've got Haven, which is the Home Builders Association of Vancouver, which is a part of, you know, like the Canadian Home Builders Association. And if you have any kind of referrals from any like family friends who have had really successful experiences with any of theirs. So those are kind of typically where you tend to, to meet people. So as you're kind of going through and you're making your initial reach out, whether that's, you know, an email or you're making a phone call or even meeting people in person, if you're at a trade show, um, is where you're kind of, you're, you're thinking about what you'd like to do with your home, both in the sense of like what your dream scope might be, but also in terms of what issues are you having, what things you currently like about your home, um, what are what are dream aspects versus needs, things that need to be addressed, going over kind of what your expectations are in terms of budgeting and how you plan on financing. Um, different people have different situations and kind of having a good idea of how you plan on handling that as you move forward in your project is a good idea because uh, there are different kinds of financing available and kind of different kinds of cash flow and being able to plan that 
as you're going through the process of figuring out like what your scope of work is, how much kind of cash flow you're going to need at what stages. Uh, and your contractor is going to want to be able to know that to be able to work with you on that. And then the other thing is how long do you plan on being in the home? Because that's that's a huge aspect that drives how much scope people typically take on. And that's something that your team's going to want to be able to work with you on because that will have a lot to do with the kind of investment that you're wanting to, to put in both emotionally as well as financially. So once you've kind of got your short list based off of like reviews and checking out all of the people that you think would be a good fit, we typically will, you know, you know, you'll do your first reach out and you'll figure out, okay, yes, these people are a fit. Typically you end up with a small handful of people that you want to meet with and have in your home. Typically it's not like a long lineup out the door. Typically it's, it's, you know, three to five kind of people that you'd like to meet with and have in your home, walk through everything in the event of, you know, a renovation or in the case of a new home, you still, you, you know, you want to have a couple of meetings with them where you sit down and you talk about all the nitty gritty things. Typically the first meeting is a lot of, you know, getting to know each other, figuring out like, do you typically like, do you get, get along with this person? Do you feel like you have a good conversation going back and forth? Can you talk easily? Do you feel like they are understanding you as you kind of go through that meeting? A lot of it is, you know, reviewing from the initial contact of is everything the same since the last time we saw, we chatted with you because often, and I see this all the time where between the time that we first get information from someone when they're like, yes, we'd like to do a project um, to when I talk to someone on the phone for the first time to when I meet with them the first time to even, you know, when I work with them in an actual like design things happen along the way where they're either like you know talking to other members of their family they're talking to friends or they're even talking amongst themselves and and reflecting on everything that they've kind of learned and been kind of told through the process and things change where people will say oh well you know we'd, we'd really like to add air conditioning to our project that's a really popular one so kind of at every stage we like to go back and, you know, confirm where we're at. And that way you're confirming that what is known is indeed still true. And also if something has changed, you can address that and maintain that everyone's on the same page. So once you've kind of reviewed everything and made sure like, yes, this is correct. The information that we were working with last time is still true or no, it's changed. We've added scope, we've removed scope. Um, then, then you can kind of take a look at what the existing living space is. And we like to do this either in renovations or new homes. And the reason for that is, is that it's, it's really about getting to know you a little bit, but it's also about getting to know what works and what doesn't work. And it really helps us kind of figure out what the problems are. Uh, some people come to us with solutions, which is fantastic. They're like, this is, my kitchen doesn't work for me. I already know why. This is what I'd like to see to fix it. And some people don't really know what that solution looks like. They're just like, my house just doesn't work. We're constantly, like, it's just constantly messy or we're constantly getting into like, bottleneck points or, you know, it's constantly cold. And so the problems are just as important as potential solutions because we're working with homes all the time. So we might be able to suggest something to you, a solution to you, or identify why a problem might be as it is. And then going through that whole process of you know, discussing what you want to get out of the project, what kind of challenges might arise, whether they are permit related or, you know, hazardous material related, um, structural, a lot of these things that seem really scary when the words get thrown around, they are things that we encounter regularly in our projects. And so we just, we know the steps to deal with them. So that's typically all the things that kind of get handled in the first visit. And it's a lot that that happens it's they they take a while and you're getting to know someone so 
And then typically we schedule some sort of follow-up visit. So sometimes after that first visit, sometimes people are ready. They're, they're ready to move forward. They're like, yes, I really, I really vibe with you. I really want to move forward with my project with you. And that's, that's all they need. Uh, in my experience, people aren't ready to move forward typically at that stage. They want to meet with you one more time for a couple of reasons. One being that people want to be able to discuss privately how they feel about things. Most projects these days don't have one person who is holding the reins on a project. Usually it's a partnership of some kind, whether it's, you know, two people who own the home or like a multi-generational situation where you've got multiple generations of one family that, that are doing it. Um, more and more you hear about, you know, young people who are really good friends going in on properties. So more often than not, there's more than one decision maker at the table, for lack of a better word. And it's really important for everyone to get a chance to kind of step back and discuss how they feel about everything because it's a big commitment. And then the other half of it is that any good contractor won't be able to turn around and tell you exactly how much something is going to cost when they visit you the first time. They'll be able to kind of give you some ballpark figures as you're walking through and like a bit of a gut feeling, but anyone who's willing to give you like a number hard and fast without really like sitting down and looking at everything and thinking about it and even checking in with their teammates about things that they might not be sure about. I say it all the time where like, if there's something that I haven't dealt with in a while, I'll tell people like, I need to check with my estimator. I haven't dealt with that piece of scope for a while. I need to make sure that the information I'm giving you is correct. And so I want to get a chance to, you know, step away, organize all of the scope of work, make sure I'm not missing anything, and then come back and present all of that to you. And then the other aspect of that is, is that frankly, no one knows you well enough at that stage to give you like just one number. So usually we're coming back with a range of, you know, a reasonable start and a reasonable higher end of where we typically see projects fall based on, you know, getting to know you for a couple of hours and the rest of the information that we've collected and looking at your home and what your tastes are and where we think you'll end up based on our best guess. And then also matching that up with, you know, what kind of schedule you can expect and things like that, because those are all things that people base their decisions off of. They base their decisions off of, you know, how they feel about someone, whether or not the project will be able to get done in a reasonable timeline, what will it be like working with them, whether there's, you know, certain aspects to their process that they just like more than other aspects. And you know, the budgetary aspect is, I mean, honestly, they tell you all the time to avoid budget and conversations. Um, the number of, the number of seminars I've gone to where they're like, avoid budget. Um, I personally don't shy away from that conversation because in my own personal life, it's a huge part of making decisions when it comes to uh, large and small things in my family. It's, can we afford it? How do we swing it? How does this affect our lives? Uh, and so when people want to have that conversation, I find that it's easier to face it head on and honestly, because down the line, if you don't face it head on and honestly, it just starts getting more and more awkward as the project goes. So I, I kind of go against the tide on that one. And then, you know, just re reviewing what everyone expects in terms of working together, um, in terms of, you know, deliverables and different checkpoints in the process. Um, some people are really concerned about how, like, how things are billed, how invoicing happens. Some people are really concerned about how things happen with the city and how we manage that and just making sure that all of the expectations in terms of working with someone are clear and that you feel comfortable with what those terms look like. And then once you've had that follow-up visit from you know your handful of contractors, you should in theory feel pretty comfortable with picking someone. 
So, I mean, at that point, you should have answered kind of the questions like, can they do the work? Do they meet your project's needs? And not, and, and that is separate from like, can they do the work? Because meeting your needs are meeting, like solving your problems. Can they solve your problems? Do you get along with them? Because you're going to be working with this person for, you know, anywhere between a year to two years, depending on what your project is. Um, going through the design process takes, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a little while. And then depending on what municipality you live in, you have to, for almost most projects now, you have to go through a permit of some kind with the city. And that takes time as well in doing your, your material selections. And then you have to work with the company through construction. If, if that's the company you choose to move forward with through construction and then also into warranty, like, you know, you want to make sure that if anything happens after your project is complete, that you feel comfortable going to this person and saying, Hey, I need help with fixing a window or something else and getting them to come back and fix that. So making sure that you get along with them really well and making sure that you have a good communication established and that you feel like you're going to be able to solve problems with them. And that's, that's kind of the thing that I really come back to at the end of every follow-up meeting um, and at the end of every first meeting is that I really want to make sure that at the end of the day, each and every person I meet, whoever they choose to work with is someone that they feel that they will be able to solve problems with. Because I have never seen a project from beginning to end go absolutely like perfectly flawlessly without a single hitch. And that doesn't mean that they didn't go well. It just means that something came up somewhere along the line because that's life and life is chaotic and has a tendency to fall into chaos. <laughs> um, so you need to be able to work with someone who can help you through that and work with you through that. And that's kind of the, the big key thing um, of whoever you decide to work with. And if you pick that person, everything will go well. Um, and then at that point, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with whatever their, their agreement structure is. And um, once you're at that point, that's kind of off to the races. You move into the agreement stage. So then at the end of all this, we can review kind of snapshot what we've looked at today. So as you go through, you know, you, you make your short list of people, you do your initial connection with them and make sure that they are a fit for your project. They come, they do a site visit to kind of figure out what's what and who's who and everything that's on site. They do an assessment of the project with you and kind of walk you through everything from their perspective of like a snapshot of what they see through the project and what the, what you can expect based on what we've discussed. And then at that point, you pick someone that you're comfortable with and you start work. That's it, basically. So now we're going to open the floor to some questions and answers. I would really like to thank everyone today for their patience with us. This is actually Michelle's and my first <laughs> webinar. Yeah, um, that we've done. So we've we've hit a couple of technical glitches along the way of just uh, trying to make everything work. And we apologize for that. And thank you profusely for hanging in there with us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free. So there's a, a raise your hand function down at the reactions button at the kind of the bottom of your screen. Um, and then there's also a chat if you'd like to type any questions you might have. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments that they would like to share? Oh, Amanda would like to speak. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Um, I had a question about, um, you know, you mentioned about things change and um, you talk to different people and they... Um, uh, basically, um, you know, talk to somebody and they suggest this and somebody else, they suggest that. At what point do you guys kind of say, okay, 
that's enough kind of thing or like how much change is there allowed to be once you've sort of engaged with somebody or or is it before you've even engaged what what point do you sort of say okay we we need to sort of move forward with this plan uh yeah i mean there isn't really a like optimally we like to have everything in terms of like what the plan is and the scope of work is we like to have a pretty good idea of what that really looks like before we submit for a permit. Um, but even after that point, there is some allowance for change. We really try to have it all nailed down before we start construction. We don't wanna squash the idea of being able to change your plan or change your, change your decisions because different things that you kind of encounter in your life or maybe there's a big life event that really changes what your family can take on. It really, at each stage, there does come a point where we just, we just have to let you know that this extends the timeline. Like we're, we're now kind of past the anticipated timeline of what we typically see. And most people are generally okay with that when they're also dealing with other decision-making aspects. In the early phases, as you're picking a contractor, there isn't really a time where you know, a contractor should be like, you know what, I don't want to talk to you anymore because, you know, you want more information and you haven't made up your mind about what your scope of work is going to be. Um, there does come a point where, you know, I've given you all of the information that I can without sitting down and doing like a full-blown budget and a full-blown design. And because those are things that are a part of our service, we can't really get into those things without moving into the next phase of, of working with each other, which is, is in our case, our design phase. Um, but it's really about comfort and making sure that people are comfortable. If, if people are asking more questions, it's because they're not comfortable with something. And I don't like moving forward into another phase until people are fully comfortable with what they're taking on. Does that answer your question? Yeah. So it's like conversations. You want to pick somebody who you're able to have continuing conversations with and, and maybe be a bit flexible here and there. But as the customer, you have to sort of understand that it can't obviously go on forever, but um, you guys are open to conversations about adjusting things and that kind of thing so having someone picking picking someone who's going to give you more information than less is obviously good 100 percent, and someone who's you know open and transparent and willing to discuss options and why something may be a good idea or a bad idea great thank you uh, Nashila, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Hi there. Hi. Um, yeah, I am interested in doing a kitchen uh, renovation. Yeah. I have a 35 year old kitchen. Okay. And so, um, to what level of detail should I be discussing everything with you before I have decided on which contractor to go with? Uh, and, and do you, when you give, you give your pricing, do you have it like per square foot? As, do you have like a number saying, uh, as to the, the type of kitchen, is it really totally glam or like like functional kitchen or a very basic one? And then do you have your square footage price per square foot? Yeah. So, I mean, prices per square foot is um, a fantastic tool, which is also the bane of our existence. Um, uh, price per square foot only really works when you're dealing with, I will get back to your kitchen question in, a, in, in half a second, but price per square foot is something that only really works at best when you're dealing with a whole home mm -hmm. um, and when you know what's included in that price per square foot because different people include different portions of service. Um, kitchens are a great example because some contractors will leave out the cost of their appliances in their cost per square foot mm -hmm. um, or the cost so, so no matter what kind of costing you're looking at, you want to make sure that you know what's being included. Um, now to kind of go back to your question about how much detail, which is a great question. Um, really, you're wanting to get into kind of, you know, approximate size of the space, but also, you know, what kind of expectations you're wanting out of your finished product. So you don't really need to know exactly which appliances and even exactly how many square feet. If you're like, it's approximately ish, 10 by 10 kind of ish, or, you know, I live in a Vancouver special and it's an original kitchen. Like 
we see enough of them that we're like, ah, yes, I know exactly what that looks like. Um, and just being able to kind of go over, you know, okay, it's really aged and, you know, I'd really like to bring it up to current standard. And then, you know, someone should ask you like, okay, well, are you, are you wanting to have like a lot of cabinetry? Like you're wanting to replace all your cabinets, your countertops, your sinks, your appliances, you're wanting to do, are you, are you wanting to do your flooring and all of those things? Like, I always really want to make sure that I'm on the same page with what I understand the scope to be as well as someone else. Um, because sometimes people are like, oh, no, 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 no. I just want to do my cabinets on my countertop. And that's a completely different conversation than tearing your kitchen down to studs and building it back out again, which is typically what we do. We typically take something down to studs and we build it back out again. So making sure that there's a clear concept of, of what your full total scope of work is. And then, you know, when you come and you do your visit and, and you're kind of looking at the space, that that's another big thing because then we can kind of take a look and, you know, take a look at all the things that we know we need to be aware of, like, oh, like electrical panels in older homes, a lot of them are really close to being full. So we really want to make sure that we take a look at those to make sure that whether that's something that needs to be accounted for in the project, um, kind of coming in and seeing if you have any particular needs, someone who's like a baker and does a lot of baking might have very different needs out of their kitchen than someone who, you know, just comes home and cooks dinner every night, or even someone who prefers to cook, um, or someone who makes wine. Like all of those, all of those people have different needs out of their kitchen. And those are the kinds of things that we'll want to know from you. Like, how do you use your space? How do you want to be able to use your space? Why doesn't it work? And what's your final expectation out of that space uh, in terms of, you know, cabinetry and countertops and all of those things, we help you go through that process and the better idea you have going into it. That's fantastic. If you know what your aesthetic is, but if you don't, then that's okay. Hmm. Did that answer your question? Yes, I think so. But I still want to know that before we say yes to you or sort of hire you, what uh, do we have any figures from you at all? Or is it totally in the air? Or how does it... What is the exchange there? What level of... Uh... So typically we work with ballpark figures before we move into... So I completely agree. Uh, asking someone to work with someone before they have any kind of numbers at all in terms of expectation is unreasonable. Mm -hmm. So that assessment that I was talking about typically include in our case at any way includes like a single page that kind of goes through all the different scopes of work. So for example, let's say you wanted to do like a kitchen, a bathroom, and then you wanted to paint the interior of your home, for example. So then when I would come back for that second visit, I would have that one piece of paper that kind of goes through, okay, this is what you can expect out of our design process. This is kind of the time frame that we would expect to see based on um, what's currently going on and what I've learned about you so far and what your expectations are and, and what work needs to be done based on the municipality that you live in because each municipality has slightly different needs when you go to submit for a permit. Mm -hmm. And then kind of, you know, the planning phase in terms of what selections need to be done and managing that process with the city and then going through construction and, and the different scopes of work. So, you know, the kitchen, the bathroom and the painting. And then what I always like to do is I kind of put like a gut feel down and then I actually sit down with my estimator for like two minutes and just quickly double check that nothing has changed dramatically based on like estimates and quotes that she's getting in live. Mm -hmm. uh, so before you move into a design agreement with, with someone, you should be able to get kind of, you know, ballpark. This is a range that you could reasonably expect, um, which generally helps people make their decisions when it comes to budgeting. It's not precise because we don't know what everything is quite yet. We figure a lot of that out in the design phase, but it gives you a solid starting point and a, and a something to have a conversation around. So I'm still not really sure what those numbers could be. Like, say, for a typical kitchen that is in a Vancouver special house, which is 10 by 10, for example, and you want to do the cabinets, countertop, flooring, uh, and appliances, all except for one, 
are you able to keep one of your appliances or do you have to replace all of them? Uh, if you want to keep one of your appliances, you're more than welcome to. Sometimes people will be in a situation where, say, a, um, a fridge has recently called it kaputs yeah. and they have decided to, re well, not decided, mm -hmm. they have to replace their fridge. And then they were planning on doing a kitchen renovation anyhow. And so they want to keep their fridge and that's totally okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we just, you know, make the arrangements to be able to store it during construction and make sure that it's safe and sound and doesn't get scratched or beaten up. And then we reinstall it at the end of, of the uh, process. Um, I would say that, you know, most kitchens that we see now, once you pull it down to stud and bring it back, um, they typically, we don't see them typically going, starting at less than like $120,000 after you've like pulled it down to studs, done all the demo, and then come back and done like, you know, all of the electrical, all of the plumbing, all of the insulation that's required. Usually there's a window or two um, that gets addressed or moved around. Um, and then, you know, coming, coming in and doing your drywall, your painting, your floor leveling and floor preparation, installing your flooring. Um, and just again, all, each and every step of coming back to a completely finished kitchen. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, and, and again, that's including, I would expect that to be including appliances. Yes. And then once you kind of get, start getting into more of the nitty gritty, it, it can go, you know, up and substantially up depending on, you know, choices that are made and, you know, how many like pullouts you want, like in cabinetry now, cabinetry is no longer just like boxes and like a couple of shelves and doors. It's, you know, how many of them are drawers, how much hardware is required. Um, there's all the fancy, you know, corner cabinet things that pull everything out. They've got hydraulic things that drop down your shelves from the top level. So all of those are things that we, we want to look at. And then also, you know, meeting any kind of special needs and how it all blends in with the surrounding spaces as well. So you're saying the basic is 120,000 and then all these other special features like drop down shelves or any any other fancy things that you want would be extra? Typically we see it falling falling somewhere in that vicinity. We can see it go up depending on what's included, yes. Okay, okay. Because in my case, uh, it would probably stay with the same layout because that seems to be the most um, functional thing to do. Get most function out of the kitchen if you do that. So yeah, with, with almost any project we where we see the majority of the value coming in is, you know, everything that has that has to be done in order to bring that space up to. Because when you pull a space down and you put it back up, you can't build it the way it was built in whenever the house was built. It has to be built according to the current code. Um, so that means like cleaning up electrical and cleaning. There's there's a lot of things that people just don't think about when, because again, like you think about redoing a kitchen and you think, oh, I want to do my cabinets and my countertops and I want to replace my appliances. And that's all people really think about. And that might account for, you know, less than a third of the budget. Um, the rest of it goes into, you know, removing everything and then bringing everything back up so that you can put those final finishing touches in. Okay. But you're saying basically it wouldn't be less than 120,000, 120,000. I haven't seen it in a long time, unfortunately. Okay. It makes my heart hurt. <laughs> the prices are so high these days. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it doesn't give me pleasure to say it. It's something that hurts my heart to say, but yeah, that's, that's where we've been seeing things for a while now. And if anybody doesn't have another question, can I ask another question? The the, the time frame of finishing a, a small job like that, or like a, a kitchen redo, would be a kitchen. Yes. So if you're pulling it again, if you're pulling it down to studs and bringing it all the way back uh, again and ready for occupancy and ready, basically, I like to say move in ready, because that's a term that most people can understand. You know, come in, slam your pots and pans down, and and go to town. Uh, typically, we see it somewhere in between like, you know, three and a half to four months uh, for construction. And that's just because in in um, residential spaces, you can't have everyone in there working around each other at the same time, like you can in large commercial spaces or even, you know, in towers and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They all, ha they, they have to come in kind of almost one at a time, do their work and then go. 
And then there's a few other things as well, where like, for example, when you're bringing in your cabinetry, they come in, they do a measure to make sure everything fits properly. And then they go and they make sure that, you know, everything is correct. They've already got their main boxes, but they might have to make a few adjustments or make a few pieces so that things fit properly. And that usually takes a week or two. And then um, also the same thing happens when you do countertops, for example, where once your cabinetry is in, you want to come in and do a measure of where, where your countertops are going to go. And then again, that takes, you know, a week or two for them to go back and, and do that and, and make those final adjustments so that everything fits properly and just so. Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Kathy? Yeah. Do you um, charge for the initial consultations before you even start the work? If you were to come out and see what? No, ma'am. Everything that we with everything that we talked about and covered today, uh, our company does that without a without a cost. We do it complimentary because we don't think that it's right to charge someone for something when they don't know whether they trust you or not yet or want to work with you yet. So until you get to a point where you're like, yes, I want to work with you and you're moving into a design services agreement and you're going through everything and making sure that you are comfortable, um, we do not charge you for our time through that initial consultation phase. Thank you. And another question, if you just wanted to do your uh, countertops, your sink and your um, uh, doors, your cupboard doors, yeah. what, what, what type of price are you looking at in that regard uh to be honest with you Kathy I'd want to sit down and look at it um partially because one aspect of it is are you like for example are you replacing your cabinet doors are you having them refinished what kind of cabinet doors are you wanting because there's quite a different cost difference per you know, per door, per size, depending on the type of doors you want. Um, same thing goes for like your countertops and things like that. <clears throat> um, so that that would be something where I'd want to like sit down and, and look at it. Um, I would also say that a company like ours isn't really the best fit for something like that. We typically work in, like I was saying, at a minimum, like a full room project where we're taking everything down to stud and bringing it back. We don't bring the best Ugh, pardon me <laughs> not bring the best value in projects where we were where we're replacing like one or two items in a room in in like the literal sense but we'd be happy to refer you to someone um either refer you to someone from like haven the home builders association of vancouver or someone that like a trade that we work with on the regular and give you a contact that you can work with on that um yeah sorry i don't have a better answer okay thank you all right. So I hope everyone has a lovely evening and I hope to see you guys again next month.